record with the computer. All right, um, for those of you who are just getting on this recording, I apologize. It is not from the beginning, but we are on unit one, um, sexual health promotion, doing this work, and we are on um, section four. Um, we were just finishing up section four, privacy, disclosure, and values. We talked about your three close inner circles. It, the most closest to you would be your intimates, the next would be your acquaintances and the public. And the main thing you wanna think about is um, who would you wanna share information with? Like your weight, your preferred way of masturbating, how often you have sex with a partner, or if you feel dissatisfied with some aspect of your body or sexuality. Just pay attention to where your level of comfort with sharing is and with whom that comfort lies. So that's what this chapter talks about. And the same thing goes with um, people that we are discussing um, sexual wellness with. When talking with others about sex, it is a good idea to let your group know that no one has to say or do anything that makes them feel uncomfortable. Ladies, if you notice that sometimes the games that we play, they're fun, but they don't require someone to call themselves out and say, oh, I did this or I did that. It's like, um, I don't know if you've played the game where it's like, okay, if you've ever done. Ever have I ever? Yeah, that one. Have I ever? Mm -hmm. And it has like so many points or so many dollars that you add up if you've done this activity. And then all the people are going to do is give you their tally at the end and you don't know if they have 200 400 50 or whatever their number is but we don't know what they did we don't want people to tell that part you know what i mean we don't want them to be uncomfortable so um don't forget to share your screen again okay. yeah when i realized i couldn't see you i'm like so i'm the only one looking at the circle <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, oh, I'm gonna be good by chapter 14, Rhonda, when we get to the end. <laughs> yeah, mommy. We're doing this. Um, okay, so we um, we also often tell those in group settings that we understand that sexuality is personal and that we may not ask any of them personal questions about their sexual lives, and that goes vice versa. So you're in a session and somebody start asking you about what you do and how you do it. Just just be real smooth with redirecting that, okay? Um, don't put yourself in any compromising situation or feeling like that you have to um, answer that the way they're asking it. Um, let's go to the next section, personal attitudes about sex. Um, it is said that when providing sexual, um, providing sexuality education, we are the tool we bring to the work. That who we are can speak so loudly, no one hears a word we say. We can have an influence as an educator that extends beyond our direct work with a client, student, or patient. As the leader or facilitator of a group, we are granted a special privilege and some temporary power of sorts. With this comes responsibility not to inject your own personal biases as part of the educational experience, at least not without naming them as such. To do so is unethical and unhelpful to your efforts to create a safe space for learning in the group. Uh, we pretty much have touched on this um, through the first four chapters. Um, did you all have any questions about just sharing your biases, whether it be via example or um, just, you know, talking about what you do or you don't like, especially without saying, well, I, you know, I personally prefer, you know, but you should st stay away from um, so much sharing your personal experience. It's like too much information and it kind of convolutes what you're trying to do um, with promoting the education that's available. I have a question. Yeah. What if you lack any personal experience? Would that be considered a bias as well? It, it would give me a scenario that would come up from you lacking that experience. So you're talking or speaking and how would it come out? I'm not sure. I'm just trying to prepare for anything. Mm-hmm. 
So um, it could come off as a bias if, um, let's say you're not familiar with um, some transgender um, issues or things of that concern, right? Okay. Then you wouldn't want to um, speak on it or try to give off information or education in relationship to that because maybe you're not well informed enough. You know what I mean? So yeah. if, if you're asked a question like that, I just use that as an example, um, then what you would say is that's a good question. I would actually have to check back to some of my references and I can get back to you or you get back to them and you refer them to something that's going to give them the information they're looking for. You don't have to know everything that's, that comes along with sexuality to be a sexual health promoter. But you wouldn't want to be like, oh, no, I don't know, you know, I don't know nothing about that. You know, you just would stay away from the, the body language and maybe the, um, what do you call it, um, facial the expressions, because that would show bias. Nonverbal language would still show bias, you know? You, you know how when you, you'd be like, oh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> so you wouldn't want to, to have that that um, outward expression like that. Okay. Okay. We're getting through it. Um, personal attitudes about sex. We're doing good because it's 730. We're going to get through a little bit faster because chapter two is loaded, right, Rhonda? <laughs> yep. Well, we're, we're getting there. That's why I did the, um, I said to about 830. Um, but I'm going to speed up a little bit more, okay? Uh, thinking critically about human sexuality. Um, the main thing about critical thinking, it is often difficult to separate truth from fiction due to how much we are um, inundated with information about sex and sexuality through many forms. We talked about the media and the internet and newspapers and magazines, TV shows, all that good stuff, right? Well, some of that information is accurate, but as an educator, it is important to be critical about the information received through the forums so that you are better able to serve the needs of the people you work with. So critical thinking can be used to adequately evaluate information. Critical thinking has several features. One aspect is skepticism. So you ever heard something or seen something on Facebook, Instagram, something, and it made you wonder? Well, start out with the skepticism. You wouldn't want to not cross-reference or make sure that that information is accurate or true. Okay, so notate that. That is very important under the um, thinking critically about human sexuality is be skeptical about everything you hear and see. It's not taking things for granted by being skeptical of things that are presented in print or verbally. Another aspect of critical thinking is thoughtful analysis and probing of claims and arguments. So those are key components to this chapter. That's all they want you to really, really focus on. Are you doing that with all the information that you're getting? So critical thinking, skepticism, thoughtful analysis, probing of claims and arguments. Okay, hold on. Hot button topics. We're on seven, unit seven, section seven. For many individuals, there are one or more topics that are difficult to teach due to past experiences or trauma, strong values, belief, general discomforts with the topic. Topics that tend to raise intense feelings within us are called hot button topics. Now, educators must recognize what areas may be a challenge for them. So in this unit, what they do is give you a list of um, topics. And what you would do is um, personally analyze how those topics make you feel. So they're using a scale one to 10 and says one is low intensity um, dis or, or discomfort. So you're rating the intensity or discomfort of the topic. 
10 is high intensity or high discomfort. What'd you say? No, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Okay, so um I was gonna say it was a little echo. I don't know why. Okay, is it gone or is it still there? When you were talking. Really? Yeah, it is. I hear it now. Mm, it just started. I don't know. Um let me know if I should hold up or switch and do something. But um, so the topics here, abstinence until marriage, birth control and contraception, um, gender diversity, including transgender. So what you would rate is say, oh, how do I feel about discussing that subject? Is there a high level of discomfort or high level of intensity? And so, Jasmine, that reminds me of what your question was in a previous chapter. Mm -hmm. OK? OK. So you might consider how you might explore these topics the echo, uh, in greater depth so that you can learn to talk about them more comfortably and without discomfort. So usually educating yourself about it or getting some information, it'll help with the discomfort. So whether it's because of your, your past experiences or just not knowing enough information about it, that's what they're recommending, that you kind of do a little more research and study on that. Sister, mute everybody and then go back to talking. It might help. Okay. Let me see. Okay, how is that? Oh, I muted you. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, is it better? Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to get it together. Okay, wait. There we go. Um, boundaries and confidentiality. Just that we just as we all have our hot button button topics, those around us may too. Considerations about boundaries for those who educate others about sexuality is, are critical. First, we must be mindful about how we use the privilege and power that our position as group leader can follow us, allow us, excuse me. The group looks to us to set the tone, keep the pace, and assure it is safe, productive, and enjoyable experience for everyone. I can't express that more if you're doing parties, you know that this is really, really important. You don't want to expose someone or make someone feel uncomfortable. So it's really, really important to be the lead. If someone else is saying something in a group that's like offensive, address it, you know, out of love and out of professionalism, but you definitely want to address it. You want to set that tone, keep the pace, and let everyone know that this is that safe space. Um, while we want to have intention or um, or plan on going into each interaction or session, it is often the case that what creates a sense of responsiveness and energy in these interactions is our ability to trust the group to raise the issues and questions they want to have addressed. And we're experiencing that in our VIP groups, wouldn't you all say? <laughs> You know, there's the different comfort levels for people expressing themselves, okay? Uh, when it comes to confidentiality, it is an aspect of setting the tone for your group that establishes a boundary in terms of what gets shared beyond your group. It is a good idea to encourage folks to agree to what happens in your group, stay in your group. This means that group members should agree that they won't tell other people what was said or who said what and be sure to establish these ground rules at the onset, at the outset, okay?
Um, so this next point is definitely saying that um, given the nature of our work and our intent to improve certain aspects of clients, students, patients, family members, et cetera, there will, will be times when we do find ourselves collecting information about very personal and specific behaviors and attitudes. Well, in clinics, counseling offices, and other therapeutic settings, it's common for notes to be taken for paper or electronic files. So if you guys know about HIPAA regulation, they're pretty much saying don't expose people's personal information. Uh, when this is the case, we are required to uphold the highest standards to protect the privacy and confidentiality of each student, client, and patient. We can use the ways to link an identity to a file or document without including or identifying information. And it's important that students know we are doing this and other actions to protect their privacy. However, for most sexual health educators, there would be no reason to take notes or record information about what people tell you about their sexual lives. After saying all of that, they're like, pretty much, you don't have no reason to have that information document. Okay. Um, now, there are important exceptions to this confidentiality rule. Any knowledge or belief that a child or elderly person is in danger of abuse or neglect typically may require a report to local protective services, a office. You have to check with your local law enforcement agency if you have questions about what you are required to report in your area. So it's on each individual to know your state regulations to make sure that you are following um, good practice, okay? Um, it's easy when it's children, we kind of can relate to what's not okay and what is, um, but also when it relates to adults and sexuality and other things, there are things that are not safe and appropriate. And um, when do you say, oh no, this is not okay, somebody needs some other type of help. This has to be reported. Each state defines sexual behavior for underage minors differently, and some consider any sexual behavior with young people under certain ages to be legally defined as sexual assault and therefore reportable crimes. It is important to be informed about what reporting requirements are for your state. Okay? Hold on. Uh, we are going to knowing your limits. Knowing your limits is a critical aspect of ethical and effective work as sexuality educator. It can be tempting to want to help when people ask for advice or information about sexual issues. However, we must be mindful of our role as educators. We can provide accurate information, a different perspective, assurance, and referrals. That's it. If you guys want to write that down, please do. That's what our role is. Provide accurate information, a different perspective, assurance, and referrals. In bold print, they're letting, letting us know, unless we are trained and properly credentialed as counselors or therapists, we are not positioned to counsel, treat, or advise. They're using examples and some other things. We do not have to um, read through that. Um, that is the gist of this particular chapter. Okay. So just referring someone over to who they really need to talk to is really, really important. Um, some thoughts about behavior change. Because educators may often find themselves providing others with specific suggestions as to how they might change their behavior or try something new, it is important to consider several key issues related to behavior change. Just as teaching is not as simple as telling, behavior change typically is not as simple as someone knowing that they should make a change. We know that from dieting and all other kind of stuff, right? We know we need to do better, but we don't always do it or don't know where to start. 
Even having the skill to create the change doesn't necessarily make it happen. Oftentimes, gaining accurate information or new perspectives about sexuality can encourage people to increase health promoting behaviors in their lives and reduce behaviors that might pose more risk. This can take time and a sense of readiness, which may not happen overnight. And also change tends to be more successful when it is something that is wanted by the person. So if you've ever shared something with someone and they ain't into that right now, it doesn't really help, does it? Not as much as you want it to help because they have to be ready for whatever it is. Self-disclosure, using an educational setting to tell people about our own sexual desires or sexual behaviors, relationships or opinions can be very unprofessional and distracting. Pretty much this whole chapter has said that in some way or form, but they have a whole section saying self-disclosure. While it is a great idea to find fun ways to connect one-on-one -on -one with members of your group and build a sense of mutual support and positive intent, it is critical to not focus much on ourselves. Sometimes it can seem like a good idea to talk about your own experience or some behaviors or how things have gone in your relationships, but be very careful about doing this. While it can feel positive to position you um, as experienced in a certain area, it can be distracting to the group and unhelpful to the learning process. Sharing your opinions and experiences can provide your student with a distorted and even inaccurate view based on their perceptions about you. Pretty much if you're talking about yourself and explaining all about what you're doing, they are kind of losing the, the point and what the education that you're trying to share. And remember, it's like TMI, too much information. <laughs> we'll need everybody focusing on what you're doing in the bedroom. Okay, so they got some keys in here about adult learners. And if you guys, you all can um, follow along in the unit, we're getting ready to get towards the quiz. And I wanna make sure that you understand those, those um, answers, okay? Um, adult learners, facilitating a learning process is always an adventure. When work, working with adult learners, remember that adults learn best when, one, Learning materials are varied. I think children and adults are the same in this one. Try using a combination of written materials, hands-on activities, emotional connections, or illustrations. The next one, adult learners, they anticipate that they will use what they learn somehow. If it's relatable, they do so much better. Oh yeah, I need to know about that. That's, all, that's me right there. Um, threats and the need to protect one's self-image are minimized creating that safe place ladies we want to make sure that they feel very comfortable and they're not worried about how someone's going to look at them participation opportunities draw on the existing wisdom within the group um, adult learners they also experience the experience can be as self-directed as possible and last but not least sessions are well planned organized and prepared for. Your confidence in presenting the material, being organized, knowing what they know what to expect and can kind of follow along with you is gonna give them a level of comfort, okay? Um, so there is a visual here. It only takes a minute to do and is very powerful. It's not enough to do learning activities. We must facilitate a process for our students to learn from the activities. We do this by stopping to occasionally ask, what did we just do? Can we learn from it? And how we use it in our lives? So they kind of have a visual here to help you with um, that process. Okay, we talked about it, but that's the visual that goes along with it. Okay, responding to questions. Um, 
Everyone's learning can be maximized through answering students' questions as broadly as possible. Answering questions provide a rich opportunity to generate interesting discussion in a group. Be positive and approachable. Reward questioning by smiling and saying, oh, I'm so glad you asked, or great question. Also try to model setting limits in your responses. For example, if someone asks you what your favorite sex position is, even though you've already established a boundary that no one will ask each other's personal sex questions, you might say, many people are curious about each other's sexual lives. But at this party, we aren't asking each other direct questions about each other's sex lives. That said, I can tell you that some of the most common intercourse positions worldwide are missionary, partner on top, and rear entry. But there are also many ways to have sex, including oral sex, toy play, and massage. Now, y'all can unmute for a minute. How did y'all like those responses? <laughs> Everybody's still in there. <laughs> no, I don't have nobody. I think those were fine. I didn't know I was muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so I thought that um, the, the example that they used, it took the energy off the fact that the person really did just ask a very, very personal question in a group setting. And that, um, you know, they they gave the information that they're looking for still but it the question could have been asked differently knowing that well, people weren't going to ask personal questions like that but they redirected it give them what they want to know just maybe not the way they asked it <laughs> all right so y'all ready for it? go ahead that's actually a better answer for my initial question was because I was worried about like if I get asked questions about sexual experience when I don't have any. Mm -hmm. So like it's like, well, let me tell you about the most common such and such and such and such. Yes. So you don't have to even be outside your comfort zone too much, like, well, I don't know what that is. I haven't, you know. It's they don't know what you know. <laughs> And, and the good thing about this course, it's going to give you enough information where you can kind of discuss things without people knowing whether you've done that or not. Um, so hopefully that was hopefully that was good. So are you guys ready to do the quiz? We'll go over the quiz information. All right. I done messed up because I wasn't supposed to go to almost eight o'clock, y'all. I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. It's already fast paced. But um, I want us to get finished, <laughs> so we're going to see. All right, we're going to go to the quiz. Y'all see my score, so I'm sharing. It's okay. Um, I did get an 80%. I think they want you to get at least an 80% or above. And most of the um, sections have something like, um, what is it, about 15 questions each one? Yeah, so can you retake the quiz if you get if you don't get a high enough score? I don't think you can retake it. It looked like it had reset. Hold on. But I don't think I think you can if you don't pass then it'll let you retake it. Oh, okay. Oh, it's saying submit my answer. So mm -hmm. okay, so if you have notes or you just want to uh, follow along. I want you to be able to get off this call, I mean, off the Zoom and, you know, tonight or tomorrow, go ahead and, and do this because we went over a lot of information. You have it. It's here. Well, okay. We're doing this together. You can yes, do this. we're doing this together. You got to feel supported and like, I got this. <laughs> um, so question one, as an educator, sharing your opinions on issues and personal experiences related to sexuality is a recommended teaching technique, true or false? False. <laughs> All right, does everybody agree that that would be false? Okay, sharing your opinions on issues and personal experiences is not the best way. Okay, the term used to refer to the sum of biological characteristics that are often used 
to group females males or intersex is called what is it gender birth assigned sex gender non-binary b birth assigned sex yeah what you say Rhonda? what you say <laughs> she got the thumbs up so i'm a, uh we're gonna be able to see me do this over so we'll know right but um yes as an educator when you do not know the correct answer to a question you should admit it true or false true true absolutely and then give them references Give them references or get back to them. You know, it's okay. Oh, let me look that up. Good question. In the United States, many individuals grow up without a visible role model who can show them how to talk about sexuality. True or false? True. All right. Okay, um, as a sexuality educator, what is an important way to facilitate learning within your group? Always knowing the correct answer, helping individuals feel safe in the experience, using correct medical terminology at all times, or focusing on coming to a conclusion during a group disagreement. What is an important way to facilitate learning within your group. It's a little tricky, but y'all got this. Come on. Helping individuals feel safe in the experience? Yes, that is the most important. They did say using correct medical terminology is good, right? But it is not important to do at all times. And it is not more important than having someone feel safe. So you see why we got that. That is the, the, the right answer, right? Audrian. Okay, which of the following statements are important to keep in mind when communicating about sexuality to clients, students, patients, or family? Is it the first one? Is it important to keep in mind the influence you have as an educator? Diversity within groups is always obvious and should be taken into consideration. Is it the third option? An important part of communication is the feeling you leave with your student in addition to the information you provide. Is it two of the above are correct? Two Anybody? of the above are correct. All right, y'all thumbs up. All right. Two of the above are correct. You're absolutely right. Because first of all, you know diversity within group is always um, not not always obvious, right? So you wouldn't you wouldn't um, you you wouldn't um, be biased not knowing what everybody's diversity is. You know what I mean? Diversity within groups is always obvious and shouldn't be taken into consideration. You know that that would be a, a major mess up, right? Because <laughs> it always shows you're biased. Right. So it is important to keep in mind the influence you have as an educator. We're, we're, that's what we're learning. That's what this whole chapter is about. Oh, let me keep going. I forgot um, time. And then you know the last one, uh, important part of the communication. <laughs> uh, number seven. Blank helps to set the tone of the group and establish boundaries about what gets shared in the group. The mantra, what happens in the group stays in the group, helps to describe this, this, <laughs> this concept. Confidentiality, <laughs> set up, Rhonda. <laughs> Values, <laughs> beliefs, or norms. Confidentiality. On, <laughs> Confidentiality. <laughs> Your parties are Vegas. What happens here stays here. <laughs> right. All right. Facilitating learning with adults works best when um, learning materials are consistent and do not change. 
experiences are directed solely by the educator. Participation opportunities draw on the existing wisdom of the group or none of these above describe the ideal learning conditions. Which one is it? I want to say C. Yeah, the third one. Participation opportunities draw on the existing wisdom of the group. Everybody agree? Yes. All right. We almost there, y'all. Nine, sex education received by most students in the U.S. is complete, comprehensive, and sex positive. <laughs> Incomplete, fragmented, and often based on ineffective teaching techniques. Is it incomplete but based on effective teaching techniques? Incomplete but sex positive. It's B. It's a hot mm. mess. <laughs> right. It's <B. laughs> right. It's incomplete. It's fragmented. And then it's also based on ineffective teaching techniques. And we talked about how many people come out of high school and in college and don't know, no, don't even know the anatomy part that they say they cover real good. <laughs> right? <laughs> so ding ding ding. Uh-oh, we gotta hurry up. Baby coming. Here we go. Okay, research has shown that comprehensive um, sex education results in substantially more negative outcomes, substantially more positive outcomes, neither positive or negative outcomes, or increased rates of teen pregnancy. B. B. Substantially more positive outcomes. People can make those informed decisions. We talked about that today. All right, 11, teachable moments are moments during the education seminar that the class asks questions, moments during the educational seminar that the teacher asks questions, moments where the participants can learn about something they may have never learned before otherwise, excuse me, moments of one-on-one -on -one student teacher interaction after the educational seminar. C. Moments where the participants can learn about something they may have never learned otherwise. We got a thumbs up on C. We're going to find out if it ain't right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. How should your language impact the way that you teach? We did, we talked about language and terminology, so let's go. The delivery of your language should remain monotone. Your language should represent, um, your language should represent your personal views on the topic. Your language should aim to please all participants. Or your language should remain neutral when talking about sensitive issues as to avoid conveying personal biases. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did I do good during our reading highlighting the main things? <laughs> Just in case you're like, oh yeah, we talked about them personal biases like the whole time, right? <laughs> okay. What are the three circular levels of closeness? You guys have this, right? Intimates, acquaintances, and the public intimates friends and acquaintances intimates friends and the public intimates acquaintances and the media <laughs> hey. hey yes intimates are very close then we have acquaintances and the public and remember your comfort level of sharing things like your weight and personal stuff this is kind of like the tears that it would go through right 14 the following are ways to allow people to feel safe in the experience. Um, ease concerns of conflict between group members. Make the space non-judgmental. Assure participants of confidentiality or all the above. D. Absolutely. You cannot have a group setting and people don't feel like they have your confidentiality is non-judgmental and that there won't be any conflict remember we're look we're creating safe spaces 
And last but not least, critical thinking includes the following. Skepticism, thoughtful analysis and probing of claims and arguments, willingness to challenge common knowledge, all of the above. Everybody got to tell me this one. Yes. All the above. Thank you. All of the above, because that one is, we, we went over that. You want to make sure that you're, um, being mindful of those things. So we got correct, correct, correct. Look at that. Correct, correct. We're gonna keep going. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All right, so even if you um, go by your notes or whichever, um, you have this, please be confident and go and know that you can answer those 15 questions. It would have took you a little bit more uh, reading if we hadn't done it in a group setting. So hopefully that was very helpful to you. Um, what time we got? We're gonna get as much as we can in the 30 minutes. I gotta move a little faster next time because getting two chapters in an hour and a half is not really realistic, but I do wanna make it happen for us, okay? <laughs> so we're gonna go a little faster and I might ask for a little help from um, you, Rhonda. <laughs> uh, I need to put my bar back down bottom. Hold on, how do I do that again? I have a question. Yeah, come on. Um. Um, I think I came in late or something. Did you start on time or? Yes, we started at um, 7 p.m. We go to 8, 8.30 and it's 7 p.m. Eastern time. So uh, I don't know if you had the different time zone because I think you're central. Um, <laughs> Okay, so my apologies. I was trying to make sure everybody knew it was Eastern time zone. And I unfortunately, so, okay, well, I guess that means what, well, six for me? Oh, yeah, six for you. Oh, man, okay. I um, apologize. I didn't, I didn't read <laughs> Okay, so how about this? Um, most often times it'll be recorded today we missed the first half of the first 30 minutes of recording though okay um but i will work to remember when we start the session to record so you can always watch the video too or at least maybe you can get in on the second half when you can get in and then you watch the recording for the first part okay okay um, I, I think you recorded the first one, right? The first and this is the second one, correct? This is the first one, chapter one and two. We just completed chapter one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, gotcha. and then Wednesday, same time, but we'll be doing chapter three and four. Okay, but so I just want to say it's part of one. It's a little bit broken up, would you say? I think so I can just watch the second part of this one. Yeah. Um, yep. Just go back and watch this recording. I'm gonna post it, okay? Okay. 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 Um, so unit two, a holistic model of sexual health. And for those who um didn't get the beginning half, I will close out and I will stop the recording but help you um, with the keys that I shared with everyone else about how to save these, um, save your course as a PDF so that you can have files with it, okay? So we'll go over that. Components of sexual health. Uh, just as being mentally healthy involves more than merely not having mental illness, being sexually healthy involves more when avoiding 
sexually transmitted infections and diseases un and unintended pregnancy. Healthy sexuality encom encompasses the following. <clears throat> now, I don't know if any of y'all take shorthand or whichever, but these points right here are really, really key. We kind of touched on them in chapter one, but these are the things that are not included in most sexual health classes, okay? How we feel about our body and its ability to experience sexual pleasure. Where do you go learn that at? Affirming our own and other sexual orientation and identity and interacting with people of all genders in respectful ways. Avoiding exploitive relationships or even exploiting others. Maintaining meaningful relationships and being able to experience and express love and intimacy. Making informed choices in accordance with your values. Educating others about sexuality. Practicing health promoting behaviors such as checkups, exams, and risk reduction. moment <laughs> okay you good sister yep okay i think i can move on to the next section circles of sexuality um one model of framing sexuality as multi um, dimensional and complex was developed by a Denise Daly PhD okay so look at the um, visual here it'll help you these are very very key you do need to know the circles of sexuality it is on the quiz okay so um, you might want to notate this in the best learning style that you find uh, whether it's drawing it out, something like that. But those are very, very, very key. And we'll go over what each of those means, okay? The model uses five overlapping circles that each contain topics and issues that may be experienced by individuals throughout life as a sexual being. And the model contends that we are all sexual beings, swirling all around the circles and providing the meaning and context for the topics and issues in each of the circles, our individual and cultural attitudes and beliefs about it. Okay, so the circles of sexuality identify the five major areas of sexuality, which is sensuality, intimacy, sexual identity, sexual health and reproduction, and sexualization. So we're now gonna consider a few of the examples of those components within the five areas. So this is also why this chapter is kind of loaded. Um, you are gonna either need to go back and write down the notes, but the next few sections are gonna break down each of those and I'm gonna have to give you the uh, abbreviated version, okay? <laughs> Um, sensuality refers to one's ability to enjoy her or his body. It is the both um, physiological and psychological and the ability to enjoy bodies of others. Attraction. It is the feeling of strong physical or emotional reaction to particular people. Attraction can feel exciting, warm, tingly. It can cause people to want to be with another person because of how he or she looks or how a person makes us feel. Now, during adolescence, young people experience an influx of or hormones that can trigger these feelings of attraction to others. Um, it says, interestingly, researchers Hurt and McClintock suggests that developing sexual attraction actually occurs approximately by the age 10, which is directly following the onset of puberty. You know the age is gonna fluctuate, just like puberty does, okay? 
uh, while older research focused on cisgender individuals, which are those whose gender identity matches their birth assigned sex. A more recent study involving younger gender minority individuals, trans and non-binary individuals show that more than half describes changes in their sexual attractions towards others, or what is sometimes known as sexual fluidity. However, cisgender people of all sexual identities experience shifts in sexual attractions too. Usually these are slight, for example, going from being only sexually attracted to men to then being sexually attracted to both men and women or to women and trans men. The important point, because that was a lot, you guys, okay? <laughs> the important point is to know that sexuality attraction is common, is often first experienced in late childhood or early adolescence and may change over time. All of that was just to say that. That is common, okay? Fantasy can be a safe way to explore sexual feelings as adolescents um, practice experiencing sexual feelings of being turned on or feeling in love. They use fantasy to rehearse this new way of thinking. Fantasies can happen as dreams, thoughts, imagery, and stories with a sexual theme. Fantasies are not always acted upon and are oftentimes very private and can be shared with partners or others if one chooses. It's important that fantasies are not thought of as a form of infidelity within a committed relationship. In fact, in order to avoid monotony in long-term relationships, sex therapists often suggest fantasy as a way to enhance sexual desire. Sometimes people masturbate while fantasizing and masturbating with their hand sex with their hand or sex toy. Some people keep their fantasies private and others share their fantasies with their romantic or sexual partners. Body image relates to our perception of how our bodies look. Popular American culture and media may emphasize a very narrow definition of idealized beauty what is, um, that is especially hard felt by women. The relentless saturation of images of extremely thin models who represent a body type shared by attainable, shared by and attainable to only a small percentage of women in culture may contribute to some girls or women feeling depressed or insecure about their bodies. Mm -hmm. All right, human sexual response cycle. The human sexual response cycle, oh my goodness, represents the idea that the human body tends to respond in predictable ways to certain touch and feelings. This process may suggest that people experience a desire for sex than sexual excitement. And that this process often ends in orgasm as described by researchers Masters and Johnson, and later by Kaplan. However, many sex researchers and therapists have suggested that there are diverse ways that people experience their sexuality. So in short, um, the human sexual response cycle will be um, gone over either, I believe in, in chapter three, more in depth. So we will get over it, this, this um, get to it this week, but it actually breaks down those, um, the process, okay? It's, this is just letting you know that there is a process to, to get into um, you, you to respond, the arousal process and, and how it, it um, escalates, okay? As educators, our goal is not to make sure everyone experiences the highest levels of arousal or desire, or to make sure that everyone has an orgasm. Not everyone shares these goals and not everyone needs these for pleasurable sex. Skin hunger. 
skin hunger refers to the fact that we all need to be touched by others. This has been shown to be true even with the youngest infants who can suffer from uh, physical and psychological challenges or even die without sufficient human contact. Uh, human touch, skin talk, contact, and nurturing interaction. The need to touch and be touched remains throughout people's lives. Sometimes adults can become uncomfortable with the maturing bodies of pubescents and adolescents and withdraw their playful or loving hugs and touches from teens unintentionally. Elderly people and those who live in institutions, I'm going to add a little, especially during COVID, um, like hospitals, group homes, or jail, have also also have less access to caring, loving, appropriate touch. As a sexual health educator, you may find yourself reassuring others of the value that touch plays in an individual's lives and how touch can be, be experienced in a variety of ways. Hugging, kissing, holding hands, massage, sexual intercourse, um, and in response to different feelings, love, lust, reassurance, excitement, etc. And then we have sensuality. Sensuality encompasses issues related to our primary sense, such as sight, sound, smell, and taste, that may influence our feelings of pleasure. Sensuality and, and excitement in positive or negative ways. So if you've ever had um, an experience with sensuality, you know how you could smell something and that smell can kind of turn you on just like they do with pheromones and perfumes. Um, so that's the way that works. It's kind of like a mind trigger. Something you touch, a mu some music that you hear, that's sensuality um, through your senses, okay? Intimacy. Um, whoo. Circles of sexuality, we're done, right? Ooh, it was long. Okay, um, intimacy. Caring, sharing refers to the mutual concerns that exist between people. It can be expressed as a demonstration of emotional or physical connection. Caring is a fundamental basis for forming trust relationships as we are feelings of liking and loving others. This applies in sexual and non-sexual relationships. When people care for one another, it may be more comfortable to share information, emotions, or personal experiences with each other. Um, liking and loving are the feelings of uh, affectionate and romantic attraction to one another, which facilitate feelings of connection and emotional attachments. So through here, they're gonna define these terms because you may begin to see them more often, you may begin to use them, add them to your vocabulary, but they're defining um, these things. We're on risk-taking and vulnerability. It is about the need for honest and open communication which sometimes involves exchanging information that is challenging for some reason. Even disclosing that you like or feel attracted to another person represents some level of risk-taking. Because we are always faced with the possibility that our positive feelings are not mutual, which can be hurtful and scary. All right? Um, Self-disclosure and trust have to do with our willingness and ability to share ourselves emotionally with others and know that that can be a safe and beneficial. It also means holding and creating that opportunity for others. Reciprocal self-disclosure is often necessary to increase the level of closeness with others. This is about being able to exchange with others what is true for each of us openly and honestly and know that we will not be rejected or reject so when people have disappointing or hurtful experiences with trust they may need more time or reassurance before they feel ready to trust again all right you're going to have fun with a lot of these definitions you're going to have to make yourself a little more familiar Okay, but sexual identity, 
Um, sexual identity is our sense of who we are as unique sexual beings. It is developed and evolves through our lives and is related to who we are well beyond whether or not we are sexually active or what sexual behaviors we engage in. A person's sexual identity is often related to their age, developmental stage, their gender, or birth assigned sex, past experiences, sexual identity or orientation, and partnership status. All of that, <laughs> sexual identity, okay? <laughs> Uh, biological or birth assigned sex gender are terms often used interchangeably. Technically though, sex refers to whether one is birth assigned as female, male, or intersex. And we went over that just now in chapter one. As determined by anatomical and or, um, how do you say it, chromosomal factors. <laughs> Um, typically, birth assigned sex is based on the appearance of the infant's external genitalia. All right, so when you hear that term, birth assigned sex gender or biological, that's what it's referring to. Um, gender refers to the social construct that is developed and evolves cultural expectations based on sex. Rhonda, am I making sure I touch, I'm just gonna ask really quick, based on um, our next few questions, or did I need to go through some more on this section? Do you remember? Hold on, y'all, double check. You're on mute, don't forget. Okay. I was gonna say, I, I, I stepped out, so I wasn't here for all that you covered. Okay. Um, so we, we can swing back if I miss something in this chapter because it does go over a lot of um, the technical terminology. I just can't remember. Um, I don't have which ones were like the most key. Okay. So we'll keep going. And, and since we're going to do the quiz together, we'll just um, reference back. Okay. Um, so this whole section is pretty much talking about the whole gender role, um, uh, where it refers to the cultural expectations and perhaps limits that can be attributed to someone based on their perceived sex. So we all, you know, how I said, we all have biases from the moment of birth. Remember the announcement, it's a boy or it's a girl. Humans begin exposure to messages regarding the shoulds um, associated with being a boy or a girl or a man or a woman. Such messages come encoded in the color of toys, what kind of play are promoted for boys and girls, and in how caring adults interact with infants when they know it's gender. So we start out very early with these biases, okay? Although some people may feel that there are certain things they can or cannot do because they are a woman or man, an increasing number of women um, and men have successfully challenged their gender roles or norms. All right, sexual health and reproduction. Let me see, one, two, three, four. Ooh, we got like four more sections and we already at our 829. Um, all right, sexual health and reproduction have to do with all the parts of the body related to reproduction, including how they work together and function. However, as noted by researchers, Heinberg and Ward, um, it wasn't until 2005, it became a priority to recognize the centrality of sexual health and reproductive health programs. The concept also includes one's attitudes and values about the body parts, topics and behaviors related to sexual reproductive health, as well as how to keep the sexual parts healthy. Some of these topics are most often covered by traditional sexuality course. Um, let me see. We already at 8.30, sister. Right, what are we gonna do? We got like four, five sections to go. Um, so what we, what we can do is, let me see. 
Hmm. All right. Well, let's do, don't you think we can, I, I, I would recommend that we go ahead and go through the quiz and then um, things that someone might have questions on, they'll know what section to look for it in. <laughs> we can help identify in that section if they want to go back over and read. So okay. we have um, a few more sections left. The sexual health and reproduction, sexualization, which talks a lot about media and how it affects how we perceive um, someone or how um, TV is used. I mean, media and shows and internet um, determine our images. So sexualization is um, through that. The influence of culture. Again, we kind of touched over that in unit one, what it means to be sexually healthy, learning about those good habits, and then sexual rights. So we're going to go through, and you want to get an 80% or above when you do your quiz, and there's always like a good 15 questions. All right, A, I mean, the, number one. And please, you guys can unmute to chime in. I don't mind. <laughs> Being sexually healthy only means avoiding disease, infection, and unintended pregnancy. False. 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 Right. <laughs> we know that it includes so much more. When sexuality is expressed in destructive ways, it can impair health and well-being. True. 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 Okay. One's birth assigned sex may not always match with their gender. True. 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 <laughs> okay. Utilizing multiple perspectives on human sexuality most accurately depicts the diversity found in sexual behavior. False. False. So utilizing multiple perspectives on human sexuality most accurately depicts the diversity found in sexual and sexual behavior. Okay. Five. That's blank. True. It's oh. supposed to be true. Okay. Utilize. Oh. I got it the opposite. Wait. Utilizing multiple perspectives on human sexuality most accurately depicts the diversity. Multiple perspectives and diver diversity go together. Okay. <laughs> Found in sexual behavior. Okay. There we go. Blank refers to one's ability to enjoy her or his body, both um, psychologically and physiologically, and the ability to enjoy the bodies of others. Related to body image, skin hunger, sexual response cycle, attraction, and fantasy. Sensuality. Sensuality. The fact that people identify their gender in so many ways, transgender women, cisgender men, man, gender non-binary, gender queer, et cetera, is an example of, is it gender diversity, sexual diversity, sexual expression, or sexual fluidity? Gender diversity. I'm gonna need Rhonda to see what that one is. Let me double check. I'm with y'all. Hold on. Which one are y'all on? Uh, six. I wanna make sure. Um, gender diversity. Okay. Here we go. All right. This term refers to the sex and gender that one believes themselves to be or what some consider to be a person's physiological sense of themselves. Is that gender identity, gender role, sex roles, or sexual orientation? Gender identity. Okay. And I, I've heard that when you say, what, what gender do you um, identify with? 
because I think that's a requirement for these pure romance groups and parties. Because if somebody identifies with being female, then they're a participant. Um, the rights to sexual privacy, sexual equity, sexual information based on scientific inquiry are examples of the World Health Organization's list of human rights, sexual rights, family rights, or none of the above. Sexual rights, right? Sexual rights, yes. Okay. Nine, this term refers to the cultural expectations and perhaps limits that can be attributed to someone based on their perceived sex, gender identity, gender role, sex roles, sexual orientation. Gender identity. What do we got? Gender roles. Because we're talking about um, what society. Yeah, what expectations, you know. What's expected of you. Have, yeah. Right. Yeah, gender role. She's a girl. She's going to help you wash dishes, mama. You had a baby girl. You got you some help. <laughs> right. And she wants to play with baby dolls and toy vacuum cleaners. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, 10. As sexuality educator, you can attempt to lessen individual shame towards sexuality by engaging in all of the following except. So we have supporting those who are struggling with sexual issues. That sounds like a good thing. So we're not going to accept. Um, uh, that's not an exception. Encourage communication with doctors and healthcare providers, as well as among family members and partners. I would encourage that. Focus on promoting healthy sexual and achieving sexual well-being. Or all of the following are ways we can lessen individual mm -hmm. shame towards sexuality D. yeah all right the biopsychosocial approach to sexuality includes <laughs> biological social physiological biological psychological and social biological psychological and cultural or biological, social, and external? Let's say B. Just B. Biological, psychological, and social. 12. An example of the role of biology in the development of human sexuality. Male or femaleness, maleness or femaleness, influence of genetics, hormones, or all of the above? B. E. All of the above. Really? I was going to say hormones. <laughs> okay, all of the above. Okay, which of the following is not a component of the circles of sexuality? We went over in, um, the different roles. Intimacy, sexual identity, gender, sexual health and reproduction. Gender. Gender, gender is not Gender one of is them. not in the circle. It's not in the circle of life, no. <laughs> in what way can sexual fantasy be used as a therapeutic tactic, as, as a relaxation technique, to avoid monotony in long-term relationships, to avoid engaging in infidelity on a partner or as a method of distraction from daily life? B. Um, they did say it was to avoid monotony and long-term relationships. Do we got that right, Rounder Rounder? Yep. Okay. Y'all know y'all gonna get chosen one day to be my unofficial assistant. We always talk behind the scenes and then you get on here and you have to be the support, so. <laughs> Before this is all over, it'll be one of y'all, okay? Because we're doing this together. Uh, what is a gender role? The biological difference between male and female, the cultural expectations, and perhaps limits attributed to someone based on perceived sex. Is that one? 
right <laughs> the gender <laughs> direction of sexual attraction or the sex and gender that one believes themselves to be being all right cultural all right look at that again. one would you say rhonda i said that cultural expectation mm -hmm. yeah um and you'll see how some of the information is redundant so as you get through one through two when you get to three and four and it's a little and it gets more intense this stuff is going to play back in your head and you like oh i can connect it now when you was just reading and reading you might have been like oh i don't know how i'm gonna get through it <laughs> um look at that we're doing great when sexuality is expressed in destructive ways right and they got um explanations to go with some of these but so far everything is correct we did a great job as a team let's see 9 10 11 12 13 14 and 15. y'all see that give yourselves a pat on the back we're only about 15 minutes over <laughs> but two whole chapters of a whole lot of information <clears throat> So for Wednesday, when we come together, just try to read as much as you can so that we can um, go over the material and then, because we won't be able to read everything because there's a lot of information. Right. What's the name of chapter two, y'all? Somebody, is anybody got it in front of them? Holistic model of sexual health. Quick question. Where do mm -hmm. we um, actually obtain the reading from? Okay. Um, so when you go through your pure romance coo you're gonna go to training so i also list the steps i think in comments to someone that asked in the the original post but i can i can help post it back up so if you're in your coo you're gonna click training and then when that tab opens up and you have a whole nother list of resources then you're gonna do sexual wellness and then there's gonna be a drop down on the right. And some people think that they're in the sexual wellness course because it's a whole lot of good information, shared articles and stuff that you would have even if you were not doing this program. But you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom right. And, um, and click, let's see. I'm gonna take out through the steps real quick. Log in, COO. training y'all following along right sexual wellness and then i'm gonna scroll all the way down to second to last you see where it says sexual health professional training program click oops not breastfeeding underneath the video Right, and then it's gonna take you to the Sexual Health Professional Training Program. This is called Promoting Sexual Health, The Basics and Beyond. If it's your first time coming here, you're gonna to have to go through the how to register. You see that part? Ah, uh, sorry, y'all. You would click, you would follow the instructions to register. You would click on the Promoting Sexual Health, Basics and Beyond, and it's gonna take you to Indiana University Bloomington promoting sexual health course once you register. And so um, you have learning units. There are 14. And so um, you should have homework to go through. I would do it this evening if you can. Go ahead and complete, if you haven't already, quiz one. Go ahead and, hey, 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 somebody come get them. Um, somebody, I mean, unit two, holistic model of sexual health. Go ahead and do that uh, quiz as well. 
and then just do some notes and review if there's anything else that you thought you were looking for you're missing you're not going to memorize all those definitions of all the gender specific things but you can take good notes so don't stress yourself out but now you have between now and wednesday to read unit three sexual and reproductive anatomy and physiology and then sexuality across the lifespan these two are going to be loads of fun and it's a lot of information so get your reading and get you some notes so when we're going through it the things that you were like wondering about or you might have questions then you can bring that to the study session um, but we won't have as much time to go through like i did today reading each of those sections i'm going to be like okay section one the vulva boom 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 parts of the vulva we're going to look at it real quick and we're going to keep going so that we can get through it okay um, we want to make sure that we do complete this in in the hour and a half that we have set aside. Um, okay, but, thank you for the walkthrough. Yeah, uh, wonderful, wonderful information. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, constructive criticism. If you're not already in the messenger chat, that is for people that are, I guess, a little more committed. So you can invite anyone that wants to participate. I wasn't trying to leave anyone out. But as I post the link and stuff, I know that Facebook is difficult to find stuff. So I created that chat. So if you like, just want to look in the sexual wellness study group, where, where's our link for class tonight? Or what time? Or what's the information? Or let's say you have a question about something, you can ask somebody else in the group. So that's what that chat is for. It is not to overwhelm anyone. Please mute it or, you know, do whatever you need to do if you didn't, you don't want to be in it. But it was to um, give you another way other than Facebook to find the information because I personally also run into trying to find the posts and get the information off the Zella Zebras page. Facebook hides stuff. All right. Did anybody else have any other questions? Everybody muted. <laughs> no, that was it for me. Thank you. That all was right. good. I thank yes, all thank of you. you. So much easier. And um, just just stay true to it. You're making a sacrifice in your schedule just for a few weeks, but a few short weeks. And just know that we can have this completed before Christmas, so you can still have your holiday week if you celebrate it. Um, and and you're not running the risk all the way down to the 30th of December trying to make sure you're completing it. So um, I will work on posting the recording and making sure that I have someone to be my little reminder person to make sure I hit the record word button at the beginning of the session and not um, 30 minutes after. <laughs> I volunteer so, tribute. Okay, thank you. Just be like, hit the record button. Um, Cause I looked at it and then I got caught up. <laughs> all right. I will see you all Wednesday, same time. If you are in um, Eastern time zone, it is 8 PM. That's the time that's posted. But if you are in central time zone, we're talking an hour back. So yes, I apologize if 6 PM is a close cut for you. Um, oh, you, I'm a sleepy you started head. at seven. Oh. Seven. It's a yeah, seven. Seven to eight thirty. Six for me. And then it's, it's six. It's six for us on the central. Okay. Yeah, I'm so. from Texas, so it was like six over here. Okay. <laughs> six, six, <laughs> six central or seven eastern. Yes. I think I posted it right. <laughs> I'm just talking all crazy, but I'm a sleepy head. So staying up to 10 o'clock at night, um, sometimes I can't hang either. <laughs> but I'm up at three in the morning, so. All right. Well, thank you. I did my best to pay attention, but I'm trying to make it work. Okay. Let me know how I can help, okay? Uh, will do. Thank you. All right. Thank all right. you, ladies. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye, ladies. Good evening.